hand in her crotch. It's an innocence, in a way. It's least important to me. Then the, uh, the other artist that well, I think one should take a lot of notice of your drawing, and I have in, in the last few years, is Degas and, uh, and Monk, of course. But what I'm looking at with these people is the courage they had, the courage of putting a black line down. It is a powerful black line across the back of a Degas woman in a bathtub. It isn't her pink flesh. It's that black line, that he's strong black line, which defines her, and that takes courage. And I think you have to study these people. I mean, you have to, you have to love, not that you want to be them, you can't be them, but you can use them. Uh, what I'm going to do is a, um, a monoprint. I mean, ordinarily, I guess, you would uh, wet your paper, which I have here, um, have it soaking in a tub, and then uh, just before you've, you're ready to press it, you dry the paper off and you print it, and with good luck you have a big press and you roll it through, and all, everything comes out very uniform and very even and very rich in color. And then, if you want to, you can take another piece of paper quickly and run it through the press and you get the ghost. And right now I'm particularly interested in the ghosts because they look more like frescoes. So instead of wetting the paper, I'm doing everything in a very unorthodox manner, I believe. So instead of wetting the paper, I'm just leaving it dry and I'm leaping right to the ghost. There's so many things that, for me that are going on. I mean, it's a fresco. It's the, the te it's the wonderful texture of sculpture. It's the wonderful texture of a wall. And again, it did not look like the painting, you see. Painting is painting. And, um, yeah, or the colors, or the colors. And, and as you leave them, that's what you're left with. You know, I, when you've decided that's it, that's all you've got. But here, for me, it's a total surprise. And part of that is because I, I am conscientiously ignoring the little accidents that might happen. Unless I'm working with, from someone's writing, and I see the images that stimulate something uh, in me, uh, there's no preconceived idea. It's not an intellectual thing. When I first started a sculpture in my home, uh, it, was, it was something that I had loved as a student when I was a student at Central Tech. I don't know why I wanted to do all these twisting figures and th that you'll see on the totem. Uh, and that here, for example, this was the beginning of interlocking figures. I mean, I, I suppose if we want to talk about, if I have heard people say, you know, that there's unity, there is um, uh, 
Uh, when I listen to certain music, particularly Baroque music, you can hear everything is wrapped around, everything is united, everything is interlocking. And I love that, and I love that in line. Figures would fall off because the room was hot, it was wax. And the figures would fall, I'd hear clunk during the night, and I'd know they were falling off. And it would, you come back up and you put them back up. And I took photographs, and the next day another huge chunk, maybe ten figures, was on the floor. And I was enraged with it. So I started looking for the proper glues. I started phoning around to find out what glue, what epoxy, what was going to work to hold clay to glass. And of course, you've got these two different things. It's, I, I, I'm forcing the issue. I, anyway, I spent every night up here with these broken figures. I had arms, legs, heads. And I laid them all out in order and tried to figure out which one went with which. And I finally found a glue. I'd sit there and hold it like this until it was glued on. It was very hard. I mean, I was breathing in those fumes every night. It was hot summer. And, um, and I got madder and madder. I decided there was, uh, you know, something didn't want this to happen and to take place and it wasn't going to get away with it. And I came up here and that's where the obsession comes in. <laughs> People around me think I'm nuts. But it did, it worked. No, I have the feeling on the nights when I'm sitting and watching basketball, uh, I know I'm, it's a waiting game, and I'm simply waiting. I know now that it's just a process, and when I sit down to work or get to work, uh, something will happen for me. Uh, it's not wasted time. But it would be wasted time if there was nothing at the end of it. I think uh, for an artist, uh, right away, an artist has courage. I think, and I, I think to be an artist is an act of generosity. And I think uh, you're taking great risk. And you put something on paper and, it's, and you hang it in a show and you're taking a big risk. But you're also being very generous because you're sharing so much of yourself. But there's the romantic, romantic view that, uh, you know, a great spasm or uh, climax takes place, for heaven's sakes, and you're upstairs, oh, you know, I've got an idea, don't, don't, I mustn't eat, I mustn't drink, and, and uh, go away and don't bother me, I'm going to perform this, inc produce this incredible piece. It's not that way at all. Not in my life, not in my mind. At the end, I mean, I'm now of an age and I have done so many different series of works that we can look at the series of work and we can see where I came from and we can see what I'm doing um, uh, and, ha and how I'm processing my life this way. Uh, a young person doesn't know these things yet and you can't always tell. But I don't know where I'm going. That's the best part. <laughs> The amazing thing to me now, and I'm 71, is that all of these things come back to me now, and I don't, I don't mean this as a, an Alzheimer's patient. I think that uh, everything that you look at when you're 10, 12 years old, the lines that you memorized of Shakespeare, 
those are the things you really, phone numbers.